Hello everyone. Welcome to this program called Applied Biostatistics. My name is Christoph Corell. I'm a professor of psychiatry and molecular medicine at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell in New York, USA. And I'm also professor of child and adolescent psychiatry at the Charité University Medicine in Berlin, Germany. This program has four components. Let's start with program component one called the basics. Why do you actually need to know about statistics? Well, it's quite important in order to read and understand the literature. You need to take advantages of the strengths and also pitfalls of different approaches when doing research yourself. Also, in order to design meaningful experiments, you need to keep statistics in mind because your data will have to be analyzed. You need to talk with statisticians, ideally not after the study has completed and you need someone to analyze the data, but at the time of designing the study, so that you have appropriate power and also have statistical tests and data that are useful to test your hypotheses. You will also be a better journal reader and journal reviewer when you know statistics well. You can better understand your own data rather than giving them to someone who analyzes them in a black box. Looking at your data with a statistical mind on it and actually analyzing them yourself to the degree will also help you to develop new ideas how to tackle the data and how to ask new questions. You will be more independent. You can actually analyze the data when you're in a time crunch and need to present something for a poster and you are not sitting in a queue waiting for a long time for statisticians to help you with answering your question. You will also better understand science in general and be more effective in interpreting and applying evidence. But actually, what do you need to understand at a minimum? So I think you need at a minimum to understand some basic principles and this program is designed to give you some of those tools. You need to know about basic approaches, both when to apply them, but also what the limitations are. You also need to know your own limitations when you really need to involve someone with much more statistical knowledge than you have. And also, you need to know where to go for help. Is it a person at a certain department? Could it be an online resource or also an online calculator? And we'll give you at the end of program four some useful websites for that. So ideally, you would even step it to the degree that you could apply a statistical program to your data and do some of the basic analyses of frequency, distribution, and simple statistical tests for group comparisons for continuous and categorical outcomes. And we'll go over some of the basic tools for that. Before we do that, let's briefly review where statistics come into play. That has to do with the hierarchy of evidence and when you can actually make certain inferences. Statistics help you with making inferences whether a hypothesis is true or not and how much you can believe that this finding can be generalized and is something that will be repeated or whether it's more of a spurious finding. That has to do with both the design and the data but also the level of significance and the way you analyze the data. So there are preclinical studies and we'll not talk about them. These are animal studies or pharmacology studies, but they obviously also apply statistics. Then the lowest level of evidence for clinical studies would come from a case report or a case series. Then we also have some opinion pieces where people voice their opinion, how they read the literature. The next level up are case control studies where you observe an outcome, maybe a disease or a side effect in a certain group and you compare that against a group that shares similar characteristics but doesn't have that outcome. Another way up would be a cohort study, a prospective or retrospective assessment of collected data and you compare groups that receive different treatments or have different illness characteristics and look at their outcome. These are associations. You will be able to do statistics, but you cannot prove causation because in a cohort study or in a case control study, these are naturalistically treated people. There is no control for confounders. 
And particularly, there is no control for unmeasured confounding. That can only be done by randomizing patients. And obviously, this control for even unmeasured or unknown differences between groups that might influence the outcome can only be achieved by randomizing a reasonably large sample so that these different factors would fall into both groups in basically the same proportion. So RCTs, or randomized control trials, are the highest level of evidence. That can then be meta-analyzed or also enter into guidelines where, again, the hierarchy of evidence is being used from RCTs to cohort studies and then further down the road you might have some clinical consensus point. So research study goals are generally to answer one main question. You might want to answer a second one or a third one, but these are generally then secondary hypotheses. Generally, your power to show something that's causal has to rest on a primary outcome or, or co-primary outcomes that are two. If you have too many outcomes, you will not be able to set a statistical threshold for all of these outcomes. We'll talk about how you can do that in maybe a hierarchical approach but ask what is your main question and how do you want to answer it. You test hypotheses. So what are your main hypotheses? Can you actually, with the design of the patient population and the intervention or the statistical methods, test the hypothesis that you want to test? You need to have high reliability in the study. That means that the approaches can be repeated by others or even by yourself so that you get similar results. And there is a problem with RCTs. You don't only want internal consistency, that things can be repeated and you separate signal from noise, but you might ideally want external validity. And that means that the results from the group that you study can be generalized to other groups that you didn't study. This is often not the RCT in a phase three study that goes for approval for a certain um, treatment, it might be a phase four study where you then implement what you found in usual care. The highest confidence you can have in your tested hypothesis outcome is the larger the sample is and the more you randomize. And then obviously also the more your group is representative of the overall group of patients or people that might be studied otherwise. You can't measure or control all outcomes or all variables that could influence your outcome. But if you can't control it, you might actually measure it so that afterwards you can add it to the statistical method so that you basically even out the results based on the influence of the factor that was not evenly distributed among the two groups. And a study also wants to assure patient safety and assure full accountability. The main question whenever you design a, an experiment is what is the question? And that might sound simple, but often when you are designing studies, we have to come back to that in order to streamline our thinking and also the methods for the study. The question then is what's the validity of the experiment? Will there be randomization possible or needed? Where are the patients coming from? Are the doctors, the patients, or at least the assessors, that the raters, blinded to the intervention? Were the groups similar at baseline? What were the groups treated at the same time, or is there a time lag? And do you have so-called intent to treat analyses? That means that everybody randomized is analyzed. You can also just follow people who have complete data but that's a bias because people drop out for various reasons that might have to do with the intervention or the risk or chances for the outcome. And then another question is how applicable is the design to my patient? So when you design a study, you can organize your thinking along the PECOT structure, P-E-C-O-T. So who are the participants? How do I select them? What are my entry criteria? What's the exposure group going to be and the comparison group? Which outcome or outcomes do I want to study? And then what's the time 
of the intervention or the follow-up. This concludes the first component of this program. The next program will talk about different designs and hypothesis testing. <music>